and do new again. I know those bitches have been talking about me behind my back. They flash us fake smiles when I walk past. They wave half-heartedly and say things like, Oh, hi, Emmy! Or, you're the only one brave enough to pull off that look. They're all two-faced lying assholes. I hate each and every one of them. Amano, Sachiko, Kurosawa, just look at him. Everything about him is fake. Fake lips, fake nails, fake smiles, fake personalities. Look, I'll be the first to admit that I'm a fake bitch too, but... Even I know I'm not as bad as them. I'm not horrible to every person I meet, just the ones I don't like. It's not fair that I have to work with them. I just wanted a part-time job, something breezy and casual. How was I supposed to know these delinquents would obsess about tormenting me? Amano is unbearable, but she's probably the least terrible of the three. She's a year younger than me, and she acts like she's some famous pop idol. But she's a dropout, just like me, working in this dead-end part-time job just so her parents don't kick her out of their house. She spends her evenings singing at underground bars and hanging out with shady talent agents who swear they can promote her and make her the next big pop star. She gets taken advantage of time and time again, but she never seems to learn her lesson. I don't know if she's just stupid or if she really thinks she's on the right track to becoming famous. Sachiko is the kind of straight-laced girl you see at every school, studying her ass off to earn her parents' approval. The type of girl that always has the best grades but never really has any friends. She's the kind of girl that graduates, and then the reality of the real world knocks her on her ass, and she realizes she actually has no clue what she's doing, just like the rest of us. So she settles for the first crappy job she can find, and then suddenly it's three years later, and she's still slaving away for asshole managers just to make ends meet. Instead of being humbled by her station in life, Shichiko decides to take her anger out on everyone around her. I've seen her slap customers out of frustration. Rumor has it she strangled her boss on one occasion. Apparently he's too afraid to fire her now. I don't blame him. I'm afraid of her too. And then there's Kurosawa. I could write an entire blog on all the things I hate about her. She's pretty, but she's very aware of it. She seems to have a new sugar daddy every few weeks. Some poor old fool that she strings along and milks dry. She must be nearing 30, but all her friends are still in senior high school. It's more than a little weird. They hang out around the train station bullying homeless people and shoplifting from the convenience store. I'm pretty certain she's done that time once or twice. Kurosawa is just an all-around terrible person. She makes Amano and Sachiko look like saints in comparison. Honestly, I couldn't ask for a worse group of co-workers. And finally, there's me. Emi Katsuno, university dropout, part-time cashier, and up to my ears in debt. I live in a small apartment in a bad neighborhood just to keep my head above water. My apartment building is filled with deadbeats, loan sharks, junkies, perverts, you name it. By some miracle, I managed to snatch up the best apartment in the worst building. Although the place is nice, the rent is questionably low. I'm fully expecting a landlord to wander in one day and demand more money, or murder me. I'm constantly worried about money. I'm worried about my safety. I'm worried about what the hell I'm supposed to be doing with my life. As if that wasn't bad enough? I have to work four days a week with the three worst girls I've ever met in my life. Today is no different from any other day. Amano greets me at the door, her distinguishingly puffy and pouty lips pulled back in a half snarl, half smile, and I can smell the sickly sweet scent of too much lip gloss from ten feet away. Oh, hi, Emmy. You're late again, you know. Bitch. Yeah, sorry. Just let me past. I'll go clock in. Whatever. Kurosawa wants to see you. Can you, like, just go see her? Fine. Hamana walks off. I look around for Kurosawa. The stale stench of cigarette smoke eventually overwhelms the lingering scent of lip gloss in the air and leads me to her location. You wanted me? Katsuno, I need you to process a big refund. Don't mess it up, okay? It's for a regular customer. Okay, I can do that. What am I refunding? There's a bunch of shirts on the counter. Just ring them up and refund them for cash. You can leave the money in the envelope under the register. Fine, I'll take care of it. Thanks. I'm going for a smoke break. I decide to clock in before processing the refund. I won't be paid for this shift if the company doesn't know I came into work. I go behind the counter and retrieve the sign-in booklet. 
I flipped to today's date and fill in my details. Done and done. The shirts that Kurosawa mentioned are lying haphazardly over the counter. I pick them up and scan each one. They're not cheap. The first rings up at 11,000 yen. And the next is 13,000? There are six shirts all up. Each one a little more expensive than the last. They don't look worn. And the tags are intact. I'm supposed to ask for a receipt or a proof of purchase before making a refund, but... The customer is obviously not here. Besides, the request came directly from Kurosawa, my superior, so... I can't exactly refuse. The refund goes through the system successfully, and the cash drawer opens up. I count out the correct amount of money in 10,000 yen bills, and pop an elastic band around the cash and put it in an envelope. I also print a copy of the refund receipt and slip it in with the cash. Job done. I slide the envelope back under the register and lean against the counter. Surveying the store, I can see that there aren't any customers around. It's still early in the morning, after all, and we don't usually get much business until around lunchtime. I hover around the register for a while, biting my nails and staring at the clock to surpass time. Kurosawa eventually returns from a smoke break. Half an hour must have passed by now. What does she think she is? You finished that refund? Yeah, I did it just like you said. Okay. She rummages around underneath the cash register and pulls out the envelope stuffed with cash. Her fingers flick through it quickly, counting each note, and she nods as though satisfied. Good work, Katsuno. I'll pass this on to the customer next time they come in. No problem. Anyway, I'll take over the cash register for a while. You wanna go tidy up stock? Yeah, okay. I'm not too bothered as Kurosawa wants to take over my register duties. It's boring standing around. I'd much rather be doing something than nothing. As I head toward a rack of untidy jackets, Sachiko bumps into Sorry, me. I didn't see you there. Sorry? Did she actually just apologize to someone? Sachiko? The customer abuser? <sighs> That's fine. You okay? I haven't been sleeping real well. I'm just tired, that's all. Well, um... Get some rest, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. Look, while I've got you here, I know I haven't really been easy to get along with lately. I've got my own personal issues, but that's no reason to take it out on you and the other girls. I can't believe what I'm hearing here. Shichiko's had a change of heart? So I'm resigning as of today. I don't deserve this job. I wanted to apologize and make sure there's no bad blood between us. Sachiko, I don't know what to say. I never expected this from you. Yeah. If you're resigning, do you have another job lined up? No, not yet, but I need to work on myself first. I have a lot to think about. Well, I mean, as long as you're sure about this. I am. In that case, then thank you for apologizing. I forgive you. Thank you, Emmy. Well, until next time, then. Yeah, until next time. So Chico takes her leave. I'm still a bit taken aback by her sudden personality change. Did I misjudge her from the start? No, it can't be. She has a history of abusing customers and co-workers. No way I imagined all that. Regardless, I'm actually kind of glad she's trying to get a grip on her life. I hope everything works out for her. If she's resigning today, then I suppose the only two terrible co-workers left are Amano and Kurosawa. Glance at Amano, who's standing by the door, waiting to greet customers. She has a vacant expression on her face, like always. I then look towards the register where Kurosawa should have been standing, but she's not there? Did she offer to take over register duties for me? Where the hell did she disappear to? I wander behind the counter and the register doesn't look like it's been touched. Out of curiosity, I slide my hand around under the register. And the cash stuffed envelope is gone? No sign of it? The receipt from the refund is lying on the floor, so I bend down and pick it up. It's a standard refund receipt, saying the value of the transaction, and my name is signed at the bottom since I was the one who processed it. The refunded money is gone, and, and so is Kurosawa. Did she? No, she couldn't have. Surely she wouldn't have run off with the money. No one would be stupid enough to risk their job over that, would they? Ah, there's Katsuno. You should go ask her about it. Huh? Kurosawa's still here? She seemed to pop up from nowhere. Katsuno. A word, if you please.
Kurosawa was tending to the register when she noticed the system flagged a large refund as suspicious. Do you know anything about it? Well, yeah. I processed a big refund this morning. Is that so? Do you have the receipt? Uh, here. I hand him the transaction receipt. That's still between my fingers. He looks it over once, then twice. His eyebrows furrowing. This is quite a large refund. No wonder the system flagged it. Did you get approval from Kurosawa before processing this? Kurosawa was the one who asked me to process it, sir. I never even spoke to the customer that it was intended for. That's not true, Hirota. I don't know anything about this refund. Wait, what? Where is the refunded money now? Well, I, I put it in an envelope underneath the register, but... There's no money here, sir. <laughs> She's lying to you. Interesting. No money to be found. And Katsuno, you're the one who signed off on the refund. That makes you responsible. Yeah, I did sign it, but... You're going to have to tell the truth, Katsuno. Did you take the money? Don't make me get the police involved. Wait, hang on. Do you think I stole it? Kurosawa asked me to process the refund and leave the cash in an envelope! It's nonsense. That's simply irresponsible. It's not safe to leave cash out of the register. But... I feel my stomach beginning to sink. What exactly is happening here? Confess at once, Katsuno. I didn't steal the damn money! If anyone stole it, it was that bitch Kurosawa! <laughs> Enough! We're not going to stand here and argue about this like bickering school children. Sachiko! Like a serpent slinking out of the shadows, Sachiko slides behind Rirota. Yeah, Sirita? Did you witness Katsuno take an envelope of cash from the register? Oh, yes, sir. Just this morning. She acted like she was processing a refund, then pocketed the cash. I meant to bring it to your attention sooner, but... Sachiko, that bitch! She hasn't changed at all! She just sold me out? I managed to catch a glimpse of Kurosawa smirking at Sachiko. They nod in unison and giggle. Are they in this together? Are they throwing me under the bus just so they can steal some cash? I can't believe it! I'm so fucking angry! There you have it. A witness to your crime. Kurosawa, if you would kindly call the police. Yes, sir. Wait just a minute! I scream louder than intended, but my blood is boiling! I can barely control myself! I didn't steal any money. Why don't you check the security cameras, huh? You'll see that I'm innocent! Oh, you know those cameras haven't worked in months, right? I suppose nowadays they're mostly just for show. Of course, if Hirota really wants me to, I could go double check it just to be sure. Though, I think that would just be a waste of time. Thank you, but that won't be necessary, Kurosawa. Kurosawa's eyes narrow as she gazes at me wickedly. Amano, please show everybody what you found. You got it, boss. I didn't even realize Amano was part of this discussion. She's leering at me disgustingly and slapping an envelope against her open palm. Found this wad of cash in Katsuno's locker out back. I can feel the blood drain from my face. I haven't even been out back today. Are they all in this against me? Do they plant evidence just to get me in trouble? You're lying! I haven't even had time to go out back today! I mean, what do you want me to say? You think the cash just appeared out of nowhere? It would seem all the evidence is against you, Katsuno. Since we located the money, I won't have you arrested. But you will not step foot in this store ever again. Do I make myself clear? You're fired! And I will make sure you never work in any of our stores again! I'm speechless. I, I can't even process my thoughts. The quiet giggling and snicker of Kurosawa, Chichiko, and Amano buzzes in my ears until my skull feels like it's going to burst. Hirota grabs my shoulder and tries to lead me outside, but I jerk away and I stumble backwards. My back slams into the glass window at the front of the store. Thankfully the glass doesn't shatter, but I can immediately feel a bruise forming. 
Push myself forward, regain my balance, and duck towards the sliding door. See you around, Emmy. <gasps> oh well, I guess not, hey? <laughs> I blinked tears out of my eyes as I dashed through the store's front door. My anger and fear and anxiety get the better of me. It's a good five or ten minutes before I realize I've been running aimlessly through the shopping mall. I reach a hand to my eyes to wipe away the moisture and take a deep breath. I look around, trying to keep my bearings. The escalators. At least I know where I am. I hate to sit down and compose myself. If I don't calm down, I might be tempted to return to the store and start punching those three absolute assholes. With my head down, I blindly charge toward a small seating area. Uh, watch out! I collide head first with somebody in front of me. Without thinking, I scream out in anger. Watch where you're going! Oh, sorry. Wait, this girl! I know her from somewhere. Hatsuna? Is that you? Huh? I know you. Have we met? Yes, of course. We graduated from senior high school together. Remember? Did we? Senior high school was more than a year ago. Feels like a different lifetime. How does she expect me to remember that? <sighs> Maybe... Yeah, you're Sato, right? Aoi Sato? That's me. You do remember. Well, kinda. Sorry. I've had a crappy day. I just got fired, so I'm not thinking straight. You got fired? I'm really sorry. Um, you bumped into me pretty hard. Are you hurt? I'm fine. I always rubbing her arm tenderly. I figure I must have injured her, but I'm really not in the mood to stand here and apologize to some old acquaintance. I have to go. Excuse me. Oh, um, okay. I push past Aoi. Unexpectedly, the shy and spineless girl grabs my arm and stops me from leaving. Her grip is surprisingly strong. Katsuno, you said that you just got fired. Is that true? Wait, yeah, I'm pissed off about it. Tell me what happened. Why are you so interested? I just thought maybe I could help us all. Whatever. You can't help. Some bitch set me up. She stole a bunch of money and made me take the fall. Uh, I see. Are we done here? Can I leave now? Sorry for keeping you. Yeah, okay. Once again, I turned to leave, but Howie's next words managed to catch my interest. You know, if someone got you fired, there is a way you could get revenge. Revenge? What's this girl on about? Does she have some way for me to get back at Kurosawa? What am I thinking? I can't even step foot back in the store. My chance to get any kind of justice just doesn't exist. Revenge? What the hell are you talking about? Never mind. I shouldn't have said anything. Oh, hell no. You're not going cold on me now. Tell me what you meant. Oh, okay. But let's talk quietly. There may be a way for you to get back at whoever got you fired. Have you heard the rumors of Corpse Girl's website? Corpse Girl? Who is that? Sounds like some death metal band. Howie ignores my comment and continues on with his speech. They say that if you visit Corpse Girl's website, you can request a death. Request a death? What's this girl ranting about? Hang on, start over. I'm... I'm completely lost. Howie frowns, a look of annoyance on her face. Say somebody wrongs you, and you want to get revenge on them. Go on. Rumors state that you can visit Corpse Girl's website and fill out a form in order to request a specific person's death. This Corpse Girl... Is she, like, a hitman or something? No one knows the truth. All I know is that her victims always receive a photo of their own corpse before they die. How is that possible? I don't know. <laughs> I... I've been wanting to use the website for some time. There's somebody... Somebody that I'd be happier without. 
But I'm not brave enough to go through with it. Still, I want to know if the rumors are true. If you use the website, you could tell me if it works or not. This whole thing sounds sketchy. Risky. Are the police gonna come get me if I go on this website? I... I've got no idea. Well, thanks, I guess. Howie doesn't make a further attempt to stop me when I turn on my heel and walk away. I don't know what to make of her suggestion. Can such a website even exist? The ability to request a death just sounds so unbelievable. And yet... I find myself unable to get the possibilities out of my mind as I make my way towards the train station. Corpse Girl Haunt, a website tailored for revenge. I could dub in Kurosawa, Sachiko, Amano. If I could remain anonymous, then no matter what happens, whatever fate befalls those girls, it couldn't be traced back to me. I start to wonder if ordering the deaths of a few girls simply because they got me fired is a little extreme. Although, they're not exactly saints. They're closer to human garbage more than anything else. They've always been hostile towards me. I'd probably be doing the world a favor if I had them all killed. If they screwed me over without a second thought, who knows what they might do to their next unsuspecting victim. Yeah, killing all three of them is the right thing to do. Removing them from the planet will prevent them from hurting anyone else. My heart begins to race. The trip back to my apartment's boring. The train carriage is nearly empty. Save for a few junior high school boys and a couple of women in business attire. I have a few seats all to myself, so I sprawl out and check my phone for messages. When I feel confident that no one in the carriage is watching me, I decide to search for that corpse girl's website on my phone. I don't exactly know how easy it'll be to find. Maybe I should ask Aoi for the address. Well, a quick search shouldn't be too hard. I begin to type. Corpse girl's website. A few results pop up on my screen, but none seem relevant. There are links to funeral services and anime fan sites, but nothing really matches what I'm looking for. Maybe this was a bad idea. I should probably delete my search history. Maybe just one more search. Corpse girl request a death. My phone seems to lag for a few seconds as the search is submitted. Then. A fresh list of links appears. The top result catches my eye immediately. Corpse girl, revenge at your fingertips. This must be it. I click the link and the website loads immediately. The website's simple. There's a freaking little dancing girl at the top of the screen who looks too happy to belong on such a site. And the whole site's really basic. A small blurb of text offers instructions. Request a death. Fill out your victim's information and upload a photo of them. Your victim will receive a photo of their own corpse shortly before they die. Watch out. Don't be an idiot and enter your own information or you will be cursed. What the hell? Is this site actually for real? I start to wonder if I should go through with this. There's very little useful information on the site. I mean, it does say request a death, but come on. Is someone actually going to go out and kill the person I choose? And how on earth can someone receive a photo of their own corpse before they're actually dead? That just doesn't make any sense. My heart suddenly skips a beat and I nearly drop my phone when it buzzes at me. <sighs> Thank god. It's just a text message. An unknown number? That's never a good thing. Wait a minute. There's a photo attachment? Who would be sending me a photo from an unknown number? My curiosity gets the better of me, and I open the message. Kurosawa, you freaking bitch! I knew it! I knew she set me up! And Amano and Sachiko were in on it too? They made me process a fake refund to get the cash out of the register so that my name would be on the transaction. And for what? For a bit of cash, they'd have to split three ways? Ugh. Kurosawa, I'll kill you! I'll kill you! A few of the junior high school boys nearby look at me with worried expressions, but I don't give a damn. I'm angry, I'm furious. Kurosawa's gonna pay. I close Kurosawa's message and I return to Corpse Girl's website. It's clear what has to be done. I'm going to request Kurosawa's death. I 
Read the website's instructions one more time to make sure I haven't missed anything important. Enter the victim's phone number. Upload a photo of the victim. <laughs> I can't believe it! Kurosawa just signed her own death sentence? She sent me a photo of herself! And her phone number was included with the message! My thumb hovers over the submit button. I feel a chill down my spine. My face turns pale, and I immediately feel cold and clammy. Is Kurosawa really going to die if I use this website? Or is it all a sick hoax? I run through the possible outcomes in my head. First possibility, nothing happens, and, and Kurosawa is none the wiser. Second possibility, uh, Kurosawa gets pranked by whoever is running this website. Maybe the administrator gets a kick from tormenting people. Kurosawa might just receive some spam text or something like that. Third possibility, Kurosawa dies, she gets murdered. Or some elaborate scheme is concocted to make her die accidentally. My lips curl into a frenzied smile. I like the third possibility the most. <laughs> I slam my thumb down and smash the submit button. Prepare for the end, Kurosawa! June 12th, Friday evening. When I get home, I can barely contain my nervousness. I'm shaking as I open the door to my apartment. And by the time I walk through the door, the sun has just started to set behind the backdrop of the city. Even though it's not dark yet, I'm feeling physically and mentally drained. The drama at work this morning, the taunting laugh of Kurosawa. I feel exhausted, like I just want to crawl into bed and sleep. Despite my dipping energy levels, I can't extinguish the burning question flickering within my mind like a candle flame. How will I know when, or if, Kurosawa is dead? Will Corpse Girl's website notify me? Of course not. I didn't give any of my personal information to the site. The entire thing was anonymous. And it's not like I can visit the store tomorrow and see if she comes into work. I'll be kicked out as soon as I show my face. So what do I do? <sighs> That's it. I whip my phone out of my purse and open Noise, a social network app that all my coworkers are connected to. Kurosawa, Sachiko, Amano, and I are all in this group chat labeled Work Life. We use the chat to swap shifts with each other and complain about the boss. Just as I was hoping, I haven't been kicked out from the group yet. I swipe through the list of chat members and tap on Kurosawa's profile. Last online one hour ago. Perfect! If I use this app, I can keep an eye on when Kurosawa is active! She only has to be using her phone for noise to detect that she's online. She doesn't necessarily have to be using noise itself. It's the best way I can think of to monitor if she's still alive or not. I'll do for now, at least. I wonder why Kurosawa sent me that photo of herself via a regular text message instead of through noise. Maybe she thought she could be busted for it if someone got into her noise profile. Who knows what that girl was thinking. Regardless, I'm thankful she made such a stupid mistake. I wouldn't have obtained her phone number if she had decided to message me through Noise instead. After all, Noise is strictly an online service. No need for phone numbers. Come to think of it, where did she get my phone number from? Well, no matter. I worked out in the end. I slump down on the couch in front of the TV and keep my phone firmly gripped in one hand, my knuckles white. I start to bite the fingernails on my other hand out of anxiety. In an attempt to distract myself, I switch the TV on and stream some stupid reality shows. Distraction hardly works, and I find myself instinctively glancing at my phone every couple of minutes, waiting for any kind of update on Kurosawa's online status. The evening passes slowly. June 13th, Saturday morning. Sunlight streams through the open curtains, and I startle. Did I fall asleep on the couch? I wipe my mouth in my sleeve, cleaning off a trickle of drool from my chin. The phone is still in one hand, and I quickly check it. I tap the fingerprint smeared screen, but it's not responding. The battery died! I must have fallen asleep and left the screen on all night! I race towards my charger and plug it in, anxiously waiting for just enough energy to turn the phone screen back on. After what seems like an eternity, the phone comes to life. I catch a glimpse of the clock as I swipe the lock screen away. 6.34 a.m. 
I open up noise as quickly as I can and flick through the Kurosawa's profile. Huh? Huh? This profile's private? You're not connected to this person? Damn it. She blocked me. I frantically navigate to the group chat, only to find that I've been kicked out. Damn it! Damn it! What can I do now? I've got no way of knowing whether Kurosawa is still alive! I slam my phone down in frustration, and it vibrates in retaliation. Huh? Another text message. I had Link a couple of times. Who would be texting me at this hour? It might be Kurosawa again, trying to rub my face in her victory. Well, if that's the case, at least I would know that she's still alive. I hesitantly pick up my phone and open the message. There's no text, it's just a photo attachment? <laughs> what the hell is this? I nearly dropped my phone in terror! A photo of a dead body? Twisted? Crumpled like it's fallen from a great height? A spatter of blood is flecked across the grass? It's hard to make out the details of the person's dirty blonde hair, familiar clothes, smudged makeup. This this dead body is it supposed to be me? There can be no mistaking it w without a doubt. It's a picture of my own corpse. I shriek again, unable to process what I'm seeing. I'm so entranced by the battered corpse that it takes me a minute to notice the timestamp in the corner of the photo. It's today's date, but something's off. The time says 7.28 a.m.? That's about an hour from now. I shiver involuntarily and feel the sickening sensation of bile rising in my throat. This photo... Is this a prediction of my death? Am I going to die within the hour? And then the truth hits me harder than my face hit the ground in this grisly photo. When you request a death on Corpse Girl's website, your victim receives a photo of their own corpse before they die? Before they die? I can't look at it anymore. I throw my phone to the side and I curl up on the floor. Did Corpse Girl send this to me? How? How did anybody get a photo of my corpse? A photo that's from the future? It's impossible. It has to be a hoax. A trick. It's a psycho tormenting me. Yeah, that's all it is. Someone is messing with me. Probably Kurosawa. I get up off the floor and I stumble around. I'm kind of lightheaded and unbalanced and my stomach feels queasy. Ready to launch its contents through my throat at any second. I blindly reach around for my phone and I finally grasp it with near frozen fingers. The phone number that sent the photo? It's an unknown number, but the digits don't match the number that Kurosawa texted me from yesterday. So it's unlikely this came from her. Bizarrely, the phone number is kind of weird. There are more digits than should be possible. I try to count them, but I, I stumble a few times in confusion. I eventually conclude the number is 18 digits. Way too many! In addition, the phone number seems to repeat digits a lot. 666-336-6622-666-44666. Seems too strange to be real. Is it possible to fake a phone number yet? Something interesting catches my attention. Even though the caller ID doesn't recognize the number, it has data on the origin of the number. Tokyo, Japan. My very own city. Perhaps the sender of the photo can mask their number, but... They can't hide their location. This gives me an idea, and I decide to check to the bottom of the situation. Despite my head throbbing and my stomach pleading to be emptied, I punch the phone number into a search engine, along with the keyword Tokyo. One result. The link points to a popular discussion board, Noise Channel. It's an anonymous board where users can talk about almost anything. And no big surprise, it's owned and operated by the very same company behind the noise app I use on my phone. Tap the link and I get taken to a discussion topic from less than a week ago. I quickly read through it. Topic. Strange photo from unknown number. Hey, so today I got a strange gore photo from a number I don't have in my contacts. Not sure what the deal is, but it was gross. Wondering if any hackers can trace a number or something? It's 666 -6 -6 -6 -6 -6 -6 -6 Seems like Tokyo area. I'm in Osaka. Okay, thanks in advance. Topic is only one reply. You got this too? Was it a gore photo or a picture of yourself? I'm worried. I received a similar pic from the same number. Thinking about contacting the police, but I'm not sure if I'm overreacting. And that's it. That's the end of the discussion. Neither post or followed up on the conversation. Damn it. That's all. 
That didn't give me anything to go on, except now I know that at least two other people have received bloody photos of themselves. I wonder if those photos were as extreme as the one I received. What happened to these two posters? Why didn't they continue the discussion? I feel myself beginning to sweat. My body's going from cold to hot and back again several times a minute. Feels like I have a fever, but I know it's just stress tearing me up. I checked the time. It's 6.59 a.m. About half an hour until the time printed on the photo. Take a deep breath and the doorbell buzzes? I freeze in place and I'm unsure whether I should even answer the door. It's a sketchy apartment building. It's a risk to answer the door on any given day, but before even taking into consideration that some psycho just texted me a photo of my own corpse. I tiptoe towards the door on stiff legs and I gaze through the peephole. There's no one there. <laughs> I breathe a sigh of relief. Maybe I'm just on edge and the doorbell echoed from someone else's apartment. Besides, I don't know of anyone who would visit me unannounced, especially this early in the morning. I slump to the floor, my back sliding down the door as I come to rest on the carpet. My legs played out haphazardly in front of me. I've had enough fear for one day. I have to just believe this whole thing is a hoax. It's probably karma for trying to get revenge on Kurosawa. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's karma. Doorbell rings again and I scream in shock, my head slamming back against the door I was resting against. I jump to my feet and ignore the peephole, this time simply swinging the door wide open. A gust of chilly morning air sweeps into my apartment, and I shut my eyes tightly against the sudden cold. My messy hair tangles in the wind and obscures my vision when I open my eyes. Quickly, I sweep the hair out of my face and look around. There's no one here except... A metal trolley is blocking the walkway in front of my door. A stark white bag about the size of a human body rests atop the trolley. And my heart begins to race as I immediately recognize what this is, because on TV, they always show these trolleys used in morgues to cart dead bodies around. Dead bodies? The vomit that has been trying to escape my body all morning finally finds its way out of, its mouth, out of my mouth. I retch and heave in the doorway until nothing's left inside my belly except the singing stomach acid that threatens to burn through its fleshy container. The stench wafting from the trolley is overwhelming. Pinching my nostrils closed is little more than trapped the horrific odor inside my own skull, and I gag and splutter involuntarily. My hand reaches forward as though controlled by some being other than myself. I can't pull it back and I can't prevent my fingers from grasping the zipper tag attached to the front of the body bag. I unzip the bag. And here I am, a wretched corpse exposed to the day's first rays of sunshine. I stand here in a doorway as I lay there atop the trolley, simultaneously alive and dead, but more dead than alive in both bodies. And the bruising on my face is horrific, and I reach a stiff finger to my own lips, my living lips, tracing the outline of the bruise I see before me. There is no pain where the bruise should be, and I breathe a sigh of relief, but for why would there be any pain if I'm already dead? To feel pain would be absurd, and, and then I would really have to start worrying. I wonder how I died. Did I fall from a great height? Did somebody hit me with a car? Did I collapse from some internal reason? Perhaps from an organ failure? Or some undiagnosed sickness? Maybe I didn't die, and, and the corpse in front of me is alive, living and breathing just as I do while standing in front of myself. Maybe this is all prank I pulled on myself. Dying just as a joke, but never really dying, always living until the point I actually die and it's no longer a prank. My head is splitting, I can't think straight, all the thoughts in my mind are jumbled and the meanings behind my unspoken words disappearing behind foggy clouds inside my shattered skull. To clear my head, I step around my corpse and I stand by the walkways railing. I'm on the fourth floor of the apartment building. There are two floors above me, so I could go higher if I wish, but I'm pretty sure a leap from here will be enough to render my living body identical to the other corpse on a trolley. At this point in time, there exist two versions of Emmy Katsuno. One is living and is me, and the other is dead but is also me. I can choose now to be alive and dead or to be dead and dead, but I cannot choose to be alive and alive. So, even if I choose to be alive and dead, I'll still only be half alive, but choosing dead and dead is nice and clean, absolute, absolute, and indisputably solid state of existence. I grip the cool steel handrail, and I lean over the walkway, my hair whipping against my face thanks to the relentless wind. Four stories below me is a small courtyard, paved with concrete and decorated with the occasional shrub of flower bed. I miss the concrete by about two feet. Dirt sprays up around into the air as my nose is crushed under my own body weight. I think about that photo Kurosawa sent me, with a smug smile and her hands full of stolen money, and my teeth grind into my tongue and sever it, but doesn't manage to escape my closed mouth. My mind wanders and settles on Corpse Girl's website. What was that all about, anyway? 
As far as I know, nothing happened when I submitted Kurosawa's details. <laughs> Maybe Kurosawa found the website as well. I submitted my details first. I guess Corpse Will got me. Well played, Kurosawa. I think I can taste blood in my mouth, but it might just be a memory from some other point in my lifetime. A blinking light from a nearby parked car kind of irritates me. But then my vision turns blue or black, and my only concern is how I'll never truly know what. That is the introduction. This is the first actual chapter of the game outside of the introduction. May 25th, Monday morning. I've always liked the shape of my eyes. I can be critical about other parts of my body, but I'll never complain about my eyes. With or without makeup, I think they look great. Mother used to tell me I inherited her eyes, and my big sister inherited father's eyes. To be honest, I don't see any of father's features in myself or my sister. But I do agree that my eyes are exact replicas of mother's. Mother doesn't see it too well anymore, and that might be something I have to also worry about in the future. But for now, my eyes are perfect, and I couldn't be happier with them. I wear eyeshadow and eyeliner to bring out my best features. Some people tell me I use too much makeup, that I tend to overdo it and make myself look intimidating. Well, I don't really care. I mostly like the way I look, and honestly, how many people can claim the same? Today's morning ritual is the same as any other workday. I'm a slave to the wage, and I'm not proud of it. Call me a corporate sellout, but I can't survive without money. My alarm goes off at 6 a.m., the shower is running by 6.05, and I'm dry and dressed by 6.15. I skip breakfast because I'm watching my figure. I spend until 6 a.m., about 6.30 a.m. working on my makeup. I'm out of my cramped shoebox apartment by 6.45. Sometimes I catch my neighbor returning home from his overnight shift, and if so, I exchange simple, simple pleasantries with him and continue on my way. Today there's no sign of my neighbor, so I don't slow down as I descend the stairs and exit the building. Hitting a convenience store for a can of coffee saps another few minutes from each day. I prefer sweet milk coffees, but every now and then, I'm in the mood for rich black coffee. Regardless, I never start the day without it. I don't always need the energy boost, but it helps stop my stomach growling. It's a milk coffee kind of day, so I pay for my favorite brand and get out of the store in no time. Canned coffee dives into my handbag as I continue on my way. The train station is always busy in the morning, and it's usually a struggle to navigate my way to the correct platform in time for the 712 train. Today's no different. However, I always make it in time, because my routine has been perfected over the last few months. I board the train bound for Shinjuku. A cursory glance reveals there are no empty seats, so I push through the throng of bodies and stand against the carriage wall. Whenever there are seats available, I like to sit and read, but... It's much more common to have to stand than stare at my phone screen like almost everyone else. When I do read, I read the classics. Stoker, Lovecraft, Poe, horror, western horror at that, is my favorite genre. And of course, faithful translations into Japanese are as good as it gets. My English isn't nearly strong enough to read these novels in their original language. If I'm stuck staring at my phone screen, I like to stalk people online. Acquaintances, or the few friends I have, lead such boring lives. They post about the most mundane topics all day every day, acting like they'll shrivel up and die unless they get the attention they seek. I find their dull, tedious lives simply fascinating. But behind the safety of a glass veil, I can fulfill my voyeuristic fetishes and consume as much pointless information as I desire. Knowing every mundane tidbit of people's daily lives turns me on. This morning's the same as any other. I stare down at the phone held in my frail hand. My fingers move of their own accord, scrolling and tapping against the backlit display, pausing, pondering, pouncing on any posts or picture that my pupils haven't yet consumed. Standing in a train carriage packed to the gills with people, I can't help but feel my face getting flushed and my steamy breath escaping my lips. Had I just post after post, photo after photo, memorizing the comings and goings of every single person on my noise activity feed. I catch my breathing getting heavier, my gasps becoming short and sharp. 
Ray went to the dentist yesterday for a root canal. Mizuno shared some photos from her international vacation. Kawahara objects to owning pets and thinks all animals should be free. My cheeks glow crimson. My chest begins rising and falling quickly. I clutch the collar of my shirt, knuckles whitened, knees shaking. A few people in the carriage start to move away from me, but I barely notice them. My fingers keep scrolling and I hit the jackpot. A new pose from a co-worker at my office, Tomoe Watanabe? She's a gal girl, the type with a heavy fake tan, bleached blonde hair and questionable clothes. I hate her, but I love her posts. This morning's update reads, Tomo Mo, just found this corpse girl website. Such fake bull, <laughs> waiting to meet a bitch to try it on. Tomoe just discovered corpse girl's website, huh? I feel a slight squeal trying to escape from my throat as my legs threaten to buckle underneath me. I can't take the excitement anymore. I have to force my phone from my hands and bury it at the bottom of my handbag. Deep breaths, Noiko. Deep breaths. I need to calm down and control myself. Composure is key. I close my eyes and let a cool breath of air whistle through my slightly parted lips. Feeling a little calmer and no longer ready to explode, I analyze the information I just read. So Moya wants to try out Corpse Girl's website. That's good. That's very, very good. Rumor has it that you can visit the website and request the death of somebody you know. How and if the victim dies isn't known to the public. Because of that, some people are pretty quick to dismiss the site as a hoax. However, the most interesting part isn't how or if the victim dies, but rather what happens before the victim to the victim before they die. Supposedly, the victim will receive a photo of their own corpse. How this photo exists before the victim's life is snuffed out isn't public knowledge. But the thought of this phenomenon occurring is utterly intriguing. Nevertheless, the site has been gaining popularity lately, at least in certain corners of the internet. Message boards like Noise Channel and other similar sites have picked up on the rumors, and they like to exaggerate the website's authenticity. The fact that someone like Tomoe, a rather dense, dim-witted individual, has discovered the website means that it's actually more well-known than I previously thought. It means that people are actually talking about it outside of the internet. Chances are good that Tomoe want to try it out and request the death of someone in the office. A co-worker. Me, perhaps. She hates my guts as much as I hate hers. Finally, something exciting is going to happen in our dull workplace. The next station is Shinjuku. The doors on the right side will open. Please change here for the Chuo line. The Shonan Shinjuku line. The Saikyo line. As the automated announcement reads through a list of connecting tray lines, I get ready to disembark. The train pulls to a stop and I contort my body around the other passengers in an attempt to exit the train. Finally free of the tangled mess of flesh, I hasten my pace and navigate through the labyrinthine station. I take the exits closest to my office and settle into a slower walk. I'm on time, and I never desire to reach the office any earlier than needed. It doesn't take long for the looming office tower to enter my field of vision. 32 stories of office space all crammed into one sleek, slim tower. The name Temujin is stamped across the structure in gigantic block letters. If you're looking for this building in Shinjuku, you can't possibly miss it. Temujin carries the title of Japan's third biggest banking corporation. It's a gigantic corporation, with other branches in Kyoto, Osaka, Sapporo, Fukuoka, and a dozen smaller cities I don't even remember. I've worked here for close to three months now. Not a long time in the grand scheme of things. That said, I'm only a temp, and all I do is data entry. I work on the 14th floor, along with about 60 other junior employees, including gal girl Tomoe Watanabe. I don't speak to many of my co-workers, and that's the way I like it. When I reach the building, I enter through the giant double sliding doors and find myself in the familiar lobby. Comfortable couches line the walls, circling a reception desk. Four large elevators are tucked away in a nook behind the reception desk. It's already busy this morning, though, to be fair, this place is packed all the time. I avoid the crowds of sharply dressed business people, feeling a little out of place in my semi-formal shirt and skirt. Ducking into a newly opened elevator, I tap my employee ID card to a backlit panel and press a button for my floor. The door is closed and the elevator begins its smooth ascent. I'm surprised to find that I'm the only one traveling up. 
I reach my floor and listen to the soothing chime as the door is open, revealing the open layout office before me. A static drone of workplace noise fills my ears. Conversation, ringing phones, fingers tapping against keyboards, photocopiers, and even a steady low hum of the air conditioner contributes to the overall din. I make my way to my desk, stationed in the middle of the floor, and surrounded by a dozen other identical desks. As I walk, somebody taps me on my shoulder gently. Good morning, Kurosawa. Ah, Shinja Fujikawa, my senior, though he's really only a couple of months older than me. He's worked here for a whole year, after taking an internship straight out of senior high school. He's not an intern anymore, though. I'm not quite sure of his actual job title. Morning, Fujikawa. How was your commute this morning? Fine. Same as usual. That's good to hear. I, um... Did you read any of your... novels? He's referring to the horror books I like to read. I can tell from his tone that he doesn't exactly approve of the subject matter, though. I've known Shinja since junior high. We go way back, but I wouldn't exactly call us friends. However, he's the one that landed me this job, even though it's just a temporary contract. I've always had the feeling that he's a bit sweet on me. I could be way off the mark, though. Well, I couldn't get a seat on the train today. Too hard to read while standing. Ah, that's a shame. Um, you, uh, still haven't accepted my, uh, friend request, did you know? <laughs> I have to fight the urge to roll my eyes. He's a nice guy. But we were connected on noise once before and I had to delete him. He's super obsessed with his father's detective work. And all he ever posts about is his assumptions and theories on petty crime cases. Normally, I'd find anyone on my friend list fascinating, but here's the thing. Shinja never posts about his personal life. All he writes are long-winded rants on boring cases. And it's far beyond the amount of dullness even I can stand. I fish my phone out of my handbag and pretend that I'm looking at noise. Oh, how about that? Looks like I don't have any incoming friend requests. I quickly dip my phone back into my bag. <sighs> how peculiar. Well, I'll try it and nudge again later. Sure, no problem. Well, anyway, I better get to it. Work hard today, okay? You got it. Chinja offers a formal bow and goes on his way. Before I could take a step towards my desk, a mocking voice whispers in my <sighs> ear. How long are you going to lead on sweet little Shinya? I shiver and find Tomoyo Watanabe lurking right behind me. Buzzing around my neck like an irritating mosquito. That poor boy really has the hots for ya. When are you gonna tell him you're a cold-hearted psycho? Listen, I'm not leading him on, and I'm no psycho. Huh, sounds like something a real psycho type would say, don't you reckon? Of course, this is none other than Gal Girl Tamoy, the very same brain dead moron who posted this morning about wanting to try Corpse Girl's website. She is the kind of person that likes to stir up trouble and instigate conflict. She's had her vacant eyes on me since the day I first stepped foot in the office. She loves to torment me any chance she gets. Maybe I rubbed her the wrong way somehow. Though, I'm not sure what I ever did to her. Even though she's a data entry temp like me, she's worked here just a little longer than I have. Unfortunately, that means I have to defer to her as my superior in this professional environment. She knows as much and likes to take advantage of the fact as often as possible. It's funny, you know. He don't look like the type of skank to lead on a goody-goody like Shinya. I told you, I'm not leading him on. Well, if you're not interested, maybe I'll take him out this weekend and tongue him at the cinema. <sighs> Gross. Do what you want, but I doubt he's into someone with your, uh, looks. Oh yeah, what would you know? You think he likes your flat chest, little Miss Gothic Lolita? I know I should shrug off comments such as this, and normally I would. But backing down from Tomoe isn't something I can do easily. I'll give you a tip. Guys like Shinya are smart. Clever. If you want to impress him, don't let him know your head is as full of air as your inflatable breasts. A flash of crimson lights up Tomoe's face, and she looks ready to lash out at me. A group of co-workers, juniors like us, look over to us in concern. 
Toya takes a step back from me, but not before signaling a rude gesture with her we fingers. We ain't done here, Noriko. Watch your back. I'm trembling. Tavai walks away and I breathe a sigh of relief. If it wasn't for having to deal with her, I wouldn't dread coming to work every day. Anyway, I wonder when she's playing a Tessa Corpse Girls website. Will she try it on me since we just fought? I'm not really sure if I should be excited or scared. Either way, it will definitely be fun to find out what happens if she does try the website. I finally reach my desk and take note of the time. I was supposed to start working five minutes ago, so I quickly log into my computer and check today's task list. It's all standard stuff today. I need to transfer a few tables of numbers from a spreadsheet into our company's online database. When I'm done, I have to run it by a few other people and then commit the changes to the server. The work is dull and repetitive, but my salary isn't bad. On the plus side, I get to wear headphones and listen to music while I work. I dip into my handbag and retrieve my headphones, my phone, a can of milk coffee, and a handful of breath mints. I lay them all out on my desk neatly. I slip my headphones on, plug them into my phone, and hit play on my work playlist. Loud symphonic metal lovingly trashes my ears as I crack open a can of coffee and take a long sip. Okay, let's get started. I return home to my quiet, cramped apartment after work. The place is eerily silent, a stark contrast to the bustling office where I spend my days. Throwing my handbag onto the tiny coffee table, I pick up my laptop and sit on the couch. I lie back and get comfortable, letting the laptop rest on my stomach as it boots up. The welcome screen loads up, so I click a couple of things, open my web browser, and then head to a very specific website saved in my favorites. Corpse Girl's website! A cute dancing zombie girl is animated at the top of the page, a peculiar irregularity that may always makes me giggle. I notice that the page view counter at the bottom of the site is nearly the same as it was yesterday. There have been maybe four or five new visitors. I heave a sigh, as maybe the website isn't quite as well known after all. That begs the question, how did Tamori discover it? Well, never mind that. My eyes scan the website's content. Request a death. Big bold letters headline the site. The intention couldn't be clearer. Further information on the site is sparse. Brief instructions tell the user to fill in a victim's phone number and upload a photo. Aside from that, there's not much else to mention. It doesn't even ask for a name. After scanning the site, I move my mouse to the browser's address bar and click. I type a forward slash after the website's address, then add the word admin. I hit the enter key. The login page presents itself with empty username and password fields waiting to be filled in. My fingers tap dance around the keyboard and within moments I'm presented with a brand new page. A blinking slab of text greets me. One new request! A crooked smile cracks my stony expression. Finally! Somebody's requested a death! Somebody's asked me, corpse girl, to kill a victim? This is where things get exciting! I giggle and I feel my cheeks flush red. This is the first request I've had for about a week! I've been logging in every evening. Fingers crossed that somebody's elected a new victim for me. Today my wish has come true! I can't help but feel emotional at a time like this. My lower lip trembles, and I feel tears falling up. I dab the corners of my eyes gently to avoid smudging my makeup. As I hover my mouse cursor over the few request button, a familiar and pleasant tingling sensation surges in my chest. My stomach, my thighs, I shiver with anticipation. My hot and steamy breath began to fog up the laptop screen. I click the button. Request details. Today, 2.47 p.m. local time. Victim's phone, downloading image attachment. And the victim's phone photo automatically loads on my screen. And a person in front of me is a total stranger, but that's okay. It doesn't change the task set out before me. A woman, rather plain, in her early 30s. She's well dressed with minimal makeup. And she's not really putting her personality on display. It's a nice photo. Better quality than some of the images I've received in the past. In fact, the photo looks like a corporate ID picture. I wonder if it was downloaded from a company database or website. Well, the source of the photo doesn't matter. The simple fact of the matter is that somebody has made a request for this person to die. It falls to me to fulfill that request. As Corpse Girl, I take requests very, very seriously. I have the victim's photo and I have her phone number. All I need now is to select a way for her to meet her untimely demise. 
previously thought about including an extra field on my website. I have an option for the user to choose the way they want their victim to die? After all, it would reduce the amount of strain on my creativity if the method was decided for me. But after careful consideration, I decided against it. Some people are sick, twisted, you know. The cause of death could be far beyond my means and impossible to achieve. Therefore, allowing the user to define the cause of death just isn't feasible. Instead, I'll stick to my current modus operandi. Everything depends on the quality of the victim's photo. If it's detailed and the victim's futures are easy, easily distinguishable, then I can be rather creative with the cause of death. Perhaps the victim's face suffers grotesque burns. Why oh, she has an iron stake thrust through her skull! However, the victim's photo is low quality and doesn't provide enough detail to identify the subject, I have to resort to the default cause of death. A terrible, unlucky fall from a great height. Maybe she slips? Or maybe someone stumbles into her and sends her tumbling over a rail? The end result will be the same. A swift, crushing death from on high. The victim will end up face down on the concrete, completely unrecognizable, save for her clothes and accessories. That's not my favorite cause of death, but in some cases it's unnecessary. Regardless, it's still a valid way to fulfill the request. For now, it's time to get started. I can barely contain my excitement. I squirm against the couch, crossing and uncrossing my legs in a vain attempt to dissipate the heat rising through my entire body. Taking a deep breath, I try to calm my nerves and get to work. The victim will receive a photo of her own corpse, timestamp with the date of her death. It's Corpse Girl's signature move. It's my calling card, if you will. Seeing an image of one's own disfigured corpse is sure to strike fear into one's heart. And that's precisely the reason I take this step, to make the victim panic and act rashly. First things first, I save the victim's photo on my laptop's hard drive. I store it in a photo discreetly named System Files, hidden away in the root directory of my operating system. A password encrypted directory, of course. Next, I open up my favorite image editing software and load the photo. Looking carefully at the detail in the picture, I can see that this will be a work of art. I can really go to town with this request. I minimize the software, open my web browser, and access a particular website. The database of the deceased. The DD. This is known in my dark web. My secret weapon. The ultimate resource for my work. The DD is a collection of countless high resolution photographs of dead bodies. Murder victims, crime scenes, suicides. Somebody has died in one way or another. Chances are good that some perverted individuals captured the moment in all its gory glory. Such valuable images are essential to my work. Using these photos as a base, I can edit my victims' details into the picture. The process is simple. I start by locating the perfect corpse photo. Search the database, and in less than two minutes, I discover a disgustingly detailed photo of a woman with her entrails spilling from her stomach. Her face is blue, having suffocated before even having a chance to bleed to death. She's about the same age as my victim, and she's of similar height and build. Finding a photo that specifically suits my victim's features is easy thanks to the DD's excellent catalog of tags and filters. I simply search for keywords that match my victim's description and find a corpse that fits. Using this photo as a starting point, I digitally edit my victim's face onto the body. It's not so quick job that even a child can do. It's a painstakingly crafted work of art that would fool even the keenest eye. An hour passes, and two, and three. Before I know it, midnight's come and gone. The work is nearing completion. All that remains is to add the final touches. I like to add specific distinguishable details to the image. A personal item or accessory, clothes, makeup, you name it. I can edit it all in. Personal details added, I adjust the lighting and color palette just slightly enough to make the photo truly unique. If the victim decides to reverse image search the photo and discovers it's a forgery, all my work would be for naught. And with that, the masterpiece is complete. A grisly, gruesome, gratuitously gory gift for the soon to be departed. The victim will receive this photo of a corpse that is, for all intents and purposes, a perfect replica of her own physical form. She'll open the image on her phone, and a life she once knew will crumble to pieces. My lips curl into a satisfied smirk. During my hours of work, my breathing eventually steadied. My excited nerves settled into a zen-like calm. But seeing the finished art piece now, I begin to feel my heart pounding once more. The macabre vision before me is exhilarating. Adrenaline and dopamine surge throughout my body, giving me a sudden head rush of bliss. To say that I'm attracted to the sight of blood and guts would be misleading. No, I'm not into that at all. 
Excitement stems from the thought of taking control of somebody else's life, dictating their future, controlling their fate. For with the creation of this image, I've taken the victim's life into my own hands, like a puppet master pulling the strings of a marionette. By forging this convincing creation, I will compel the victim to take her own life. That's right. My own hands need not become stained. The hands of Corpse Girl have never been dirtied with the blood of a victim. This is the true nature of my work. Carefully crafting corpse photos in such a way to convince the victim that their fate's already sealed. That no matter what they do, they cannot escape the death that awaits them. And a date stamped on the photo is the icing on the cake. The ultimate driving force behind the victim choosing to end their own life. A date so near in the future, a time that has not yet occurred, and a fiber of uncertainty carefully interwoven into the image. That causes the victim to pause and consider all those possibilities. Is this photo from the future? Is this truly my fate? How can I outrun a future that's been predecided? These are the thoughts that run through a victim's mind. Despair and dread flood the senses, and overwhelming anxiety gives way to calm acceptance. This is my dead body? This is how I die? Why should I fight it? And when the victim's last vestige of resistance gently breaks, like a silk spider web being torn by a cool breeze, they finally give in. They invite their end. This is the way it will go down for this woman. This complete and total stranger. I'm confident. I'm certain. I'm convinced. There was a sudden spark of inspiration that guided me to begin fabricating corpse photos about a year ago. I can never quite recall exactly what it was that spawned the idea. Sometimes I get close to remembering, but the recollection dances at the edge of my mind and slips back into the darkness. Regardless, I ventured down a dark and dangerous path. I built Corpse Girl's website and invited strangers to request the deaths of people they knew. It was a sales tactic, simply a way to encourage users to submit images. I had no intention or means of ending lives. Little did I know of the true power I wielded. I only intended to create corpse photos and send them to people for fun. I wanted to startle and scare some unsuspecting fools. It would be a lie to claim that I didn't get off on it. The thought of people shrieking in fear at the sight of their own corpse was more than delicious. Sated in my budding lust, I filled a dark hole in the depths of my soul and it gave me purpose. Never in a million years did I dream that one of my corpse photos would result in the death of another human being. I'll never forget her name. Ruri Hitano. Twenty-something, slim, gorgeous. Eyes that took my breath away the moment I gazed upon her portrait. She was the first person to make me feel bad about crafting hoax photos. The only person to make me feel bad about it. But I did it anyway, because Corpse Girl never rejects a request. It's her, it's my conviction. I forged a beautiful rendition of her death. Thanks to some rather macabre source photos obtained via the database of the deceased, I strung Rory's corpse up in a field like a ghoulish scarecrow. The photo was incredible. It was my fifth or sixth work. The fifth or sixth time a user of Corpse Girl's website requested a death. Rory Hatano died just hours after receiving the photo. I don't know why. I don't know if she killed herself or if someone murdered her. But I know one thing. Rory Hitano's body, her real body, was found in a field hanging like a scarecrow, surrounded by crows. Her eyes have been gouged out of her skull and her stiff fingers clutched her phone tightly. According to the news report, her phone displayed a familiar image. The very image I created of her corpse. When I first learned of her death, I was overcome with varying emotions. I felt sick, elated, disgusted, overjoyed, depressed, aroused. Had I somehow caused her death? Was Corpse Girl responsible for taking a life? Even though my hands weren't stained with blood, I, I still felt responsible. A lurid truth descended upon me at that moment. Corpse Girl held the power to end lives. And the more I dwelled on that fact, the more obvious it became to me. I began to feel that power pulsing through my veins, throbbing in my blood as my heart pumped and pounded within my chest. I can't explain how the power works, and I don't know why I have it. But somehow, the corpse photos I create can compel a victim to end their own life. Or compel someone else to end it for them. Rory died in a way that I envisioned. Her dead body matched a fake photo I painstakingly crafted. And I didn't even have to leave the safety and comfort of my apartment to ensure her death. Corpse Girl's power is real, extraordinary, and I vowed to exercise that power as frequently as possible. 
pausing the game here. If it lets me. If it lets me. And we'll continue with the rest of the novel some other time. Thanks for being here, Appy. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the visual novel.